Hello, I'm Gordon Lane, editor of Cameralabs.com. I'd like to show you around the Nikon D7000. Here it is, the D7000. This is a successor to the best-selling D90, which technically makes it Nikon's new mid-range DSLR. However, like its predecessor, Nikon's going to charge you a little bit more for this camera, and in return it's really going to pack in the features. So it's a pretty exciting camera and I've got a great deal to show you. In this video I'm going to take you through those new features and crucially show you them working in practice. But first of all, let's take a look at the physical design of this camera and also the various controls. Okay, I've got three DSLRs here. Here's the new Nikon D7000. In the middle, the older Nikon D90, which this model replaces. And to this side, the Canon EOS 60D, which is the big rival for the Nikon D7000. I've got them fitted with their respective kit lenses here. The two Nikons are fitted with the DX 18-105mm and the Canon's fitted with the EFS 18-135mm. So the Canon lens is a little bit longer. All of them have got optical stabilisation. Now if you look at them here, they're all roughly the same size and also roughly the same weight. The D7000 actually measures almost exactly the same as its predecessor, although it is 80 grams heavier. That's due to Nikon slightly upping its game again by fitting a magnesium alloy upper and rear plate. That gives the D7000 a little bit of extra strength over its predecessor and also the Canon rival. It's not completely magnesium alloy like a semi-pro body, but again it is that bit tougher. In your hands though, you'd be hard pushed to notice much difference in terms of weight. And also in terms of actual quality, the build quality in your hands of all three of these cameras feels very good. One doesn't really particularly feel that much better than the other. As always, a lot of it boils down to personal preferences. The grip on the D7000, like all Nikon DSLRs, has a really nice indentation for your fingertips. It feels very secure in your hands. However, Canon, although it has a small indentation, does have a more pronounced ridge here for your thumb to press up against. Canon's also used a coarser texture for its rubber coating here than the Nikon and some people may find that that gives it a, a kind of grippier feel although again it's very personal preference. I would recommend that you pick up each of these cameras to see which feels best in your hands. Externally speaking the biggest difference between these two cameras is actually around the back. It's the screens. On the D7000 it's a fixed screen Whereas Canon, for the very first time on the 60D, has implemented a fully articulated screen which can flip out and twist to any angle. Now, this is fantastic when you're shooting in live view or particularly for movies because you can shoot comfortably at low angles or at high angles above the heads of crowds. This gives this camera a real edge over other models like the D7000 which have a fixed screen. However, you don't have to look too far to find physical advantages of the Nikon body. If I open the memory card door here, you'll see that the D7000 is equipped with not one but two memory card slots and I'll be showing you later on in the video how you might use those in practice. There are also differences concerning the optical viewfinders. Now the older D90 and the EOS 60D both have optical viewfinders with 96% coverage. That's fairly typical for a mid-range DSLR. They're also all pentaprism models so that view is nice and bright. However, Nikon has again decided to raise the game on the D7000 by equipping it with a viewfinder that delivers not 96%, but 100% coverage. That means that what you see through the viewfinder here is exactly what you're going to capture on the frame. And that's a really classy move because you wouldn't normally expect to find 100% viewfinder coverage until you go up to semi-pro or even professional bodies. So again, to find that in a mid-range body at a mid-range price is a really classy advantage to the D7000. Now let's take a closer look at some of the controls. On the upper left side of the body you'll find the main mode dial, which of course offers program, shutter, aperture priority and full manual modes. And the D7000 offers exposures from 30 seconds to 1 over 8 thousandth. Alongside this you'll find two user modes. These allow you to actually save a whole raft of custom settings from the flash or exposure compensation to the AF point and even the actual selected aperture and shutter value if required and then these are all ready to go for you as soon as you turn that dial to the U1 or U2 positions. Alongside this a scene position which gives you access to 19 scene presets using the screen. Next to this a flash off mode and alongside that fully automatic if you prefer an easy life. Below this you'll find a dedicated dial for the release mode and to adjust that you need to press and hold this button in the far corner. Press and hold that down and turn it from single to CL, that's continuous low. That's for continuous shooting at a speed that you specify using the menus. Next to that, CH for continuous high. 
This is the setting you use if you want to shoot with the D7000 at its maximum 6 frames per second. Alongside that, cue for quiet shooting mode, and I'll show you how that sounds in just a moment. Next to that, the self timer setting. Another setting here for use with the optional MLL3 infrared remote control. And finally, and a very welcome feature here, is a proper mirror lockup option. As its name suggests, this allows the camera to lock the mirror in the up position before actually taking the picture. And it's that delay that allows any vibrations to absolutely dampen out and to eliminate any wobbling at all. It's very important if you're into very precision tripod based photography. Now let's check out the D7000's quiet release mode. I've got the camera set to shutter priority with a shutter speed of a 60th of a second. So now let's hear how it sounds in the normal single release mode. And once again for reference. Okay, now I'm going to turn the release mode dial to Q for quiet and do it once more. And again. Now that already sounds quite a bit quieter but the Q mode has got a very special trick. And that is to actually hold the mirror in the up position while you keep your finger pressed on the shutter release. Now the idea of that is that you take the picture, keeping your finger held down in the shutter release, so you get quite a quiet sound, and then you move away from the quiet area and you let go of the shutter release and the mirror resets itself. So that it kind of delays the rest of the noise. So let's try that again. I'm going to press and hold down. So that's the picture now taken. And then I'd let go of the shutter release and that's the mechanism reset for another shot. Now obviously if you do that, you can only take one picture, so it's not that practical, but it is a little bit quieter. I'll show you those three modes once again. So I'm going to press and hold, and let go. Now I'll do it all in one motion. And finally, just for comparison, back to the normal single release mode. The upper right side of the body is dominated by this LCD information screen and like all Nikon DSLRs that have one of these screens at the top, you'll see the number of shots remaining always displayed even when the camera is powered off. If I switch the camera on, you'll see this display burst into life. You'll see it displays a vast amount of information. You've got the main exposure details up here and down there I've got the shots remaining. Now if you're very quick you may have noticed the ISO value there. I've got the camera set up to display that. If I half press the shutter release and keep it half pressed you'll see the remaining shots in the buffer. When I let go of that you'll see the ISO value and then when that timer kicks in it'll return to the number of shots remaining. You'll also notice two little icons here for the dual memory card slots. Alongside here, a little icon showing the current metering mode, and there's a dedicated button to adjust the metering here. And alongside there, one for the exposure compensation. But what's really impressive here is a little graphic here that actually indicates all 39 points of that brand new autofocus system. In the far left corner here, you've got the image quality settings, and above that, you've got quite a detailed icon for the battery life. Although, as I'll show you in the menus later on, you can actually display the exact percentage remaining for the charge of the battery. On the left-hand side of the body, you'll find the various ports hidden behind two large flaps. Behind the upper one, you'll find a port here for the AV output. Next to that, the USB port, and below that, a mini HDMI port. Behind the flap below, you'll find two ports. One here for a stereo microphone, that's a standard 3.5mm jack. And to the right of that, a proprietary Nikon accessory port. You can connect an optional cabled release to this, or the optional GPS accessory. On the right-hand grip side of the body, it's no surprise to find a door for the SD memory card slot. But what is a very, very welcome surprise is the D7000 can take not just one, but two SD memory cards simultaneously. Now what this allows you to do is actually record images to both cards at the same time if you require, thereby giving you an instant backup. You could keep one of these cards for yourself and hand this other one straight to a client if you like. Or you could set up the camera to record JPEGs to one card and RAW files to the other. Or you could instead set it up to just act as an overflow so that when this card is full, it just starts recording on this one instead. This is a really impressive feature to find on any camera, let alone a mid-range one, and it gives the D7000 a key advantage over the Canon EOS 60D. Below the large lens release button, you'll find a dedicated control here for the autofocus mode. And at first glance, it's easy to dismiss this as a simple switch that takes you from autofocus to manual focus. But a very important addition over the early D90 is a button in the middle. 
If you press and hold this like a shift key, you can then turn the finger or thumb dials to actually adjust not just the AF point, but also the AF mode. This is a really nice physical way to change the autofocusing options without having to delve into various menus on screen. Moving up, you'll find the bracketing button. The D7000 can bracket the exposure, the flash, the white balance, or the active D lighting settings. Although anyone hoping that Nikon's pushed the D7000 further into the semi-pro category will be slightly disappointed to find that the bracketing is still restricted to fairly basic three frames up to two EV apart. Above this, you'll find a button that pops up the built-in flash. And this is also the button that you'll hold down while turning the finger or thumb dials to adjust the flash settings. The flash has got coverage for a 16mm lens, which means it's a perfect match for the optional DX 16-85mm. That's a great general purpose zoom if you're after something a bit classier than the standard kit lens. The flash can also be set to commander mode, at which point it can wirelessly control up to two groups of other speedlight flash guns. Staying with the flash for a moment longer, you can of course mount an external speedlight flash gun to the hot shoe on the D7000, but you won't find a PC sync port for connecting the camera to external studio lighting. If you want to do that, you'll need to again go for a semi-pro model like the D300S. The D7000 is powered by a new EN-EL15 lithium-ion battery pack that's rated at 1900 mAh. That's up on the 1500 mAh of the battery that powered the D90, and you'll also get more shots out of the D7000 per charge. Under CEPA conditions, you're looking at about 1050 shots compared to 850 on the D90. Now start using the D7000 in live view or its movie mode, and that battery life will deplete quite a bit quicker. What is quite useful though is along with the normal battery indicator on the display here in the top left corner, if you go into the main menus to the battery info section, you'll be able to see the exact percentage remaining and also the condition of the battery. The rear of the camera is dominated by the same 3-inch VGA screen as its predecessor and this delivers a very bright, crisp and detailed view. It's also surrounded by buttons that give you direct access to various settings. If I press the WB button here for white balance, I can use the thumb dial here to directly adjust those white balance presets. You can see them changing there at the bottom of the screen. I can also use the finger dial to fine tune those white balance settings if required. Below this is a button dedicated to the ISO sensitivity. Press and hold this button and I can use the thumb dial here to adjust the ISO value which you can see highlighted right here. Below this is a button dedicated to the image quality settings. Press and hold this while you turn the thumb dial and you can adjust the image compression. Here in RAW plus fine mode, RAW plus normal, RAW plus basic, RAW by itself, and then JPEGs by itself, either with fine, normal, or basic compression. And as I adjust those settings, you can see the maximum number of pitches here change. Let's put this back to JPEG fine. Keeping this button held as I turn the finger dial, I can adjust the image size, at least for JPEG images anyway. I can go from large to medium to small. And once again, you'll see those maximum number of pictures increase there. To the right of the screen is an eight-way rocker control here, along with a lock switch if you want to prevent accidental access to that. Above this is the live mode lever, and I'll be showing you more about that later on in the video. Above this, a button for the auto exposure or auto focus lock. And to the right of that, the thumb dial that I use to adjust many of those settings. Right at the bottom here you'll notice a button labelled Info. This allows me to actually adjust further settings using this screen here. If I press it, you can see that I can highlight some of these values down here at the bottom of the screen and this gives me direct access to a variety of additional settings. If I want to adjust any of those, I just press the OK button and I get a dedicated menu for that setting. Pressing the menu button of course takes you to the main menu system, starting with playback followed by the shooting menu, custom settings, setup, retouch, and my menu, which is configurable. Now within the custom setting menu, there's an absolute wealth of things that you can change. Just take a look at the autofocus section, for example. Here you can change things like the number of autofocusing points. You can change the live view or movie AF mode. Here I could change it to the full-time servo option. 
Going down here into the metering and exposure section, you could change the center weighted area. In the self timers here, you can go for 20, 10, 5 or 2 seconds for the delay and also the number of shots that you take at the end. You can change how long it takes for the power saving to kick in. Choose whether to see the alignment grid in the viewfinder. Scrolling further down here, there's just a huge array of different options. You can have the maximum flash sync speed. You can change the bracketing order, what the lighting switch does. All of these controls that you can customize and reconfigure. There really is an awful lot of settings that you can customize on the D7000. During playback, you can cycle through a variety of views. If you have all the options enabled in the menus, the first view you'll see is this one. This shows you all of the active auto focusing points. When I took the picture, as you can see, a fair amount of those 39 AF points were enabled during this shot. The next view shows a shrunken thumbnail and a brightness histogram with some more detailed shooting information below that. Then you have a series of pages with more detailed shooting information. There's even information on the lens and the focal length that you used when you took the shot. Next comes a view with brightness and RGB histograms. And finally, you have a view here which actually shows flashing highlight areas. And as I discovered with many of the exposures on the D7000, this was very, very useful because the camera unfortunately did tend to overexpose under very bright conditions. This shot is, however, okay. In the retouch menu, you can apply a variety of effects to pictures that you've already taken. One of the more interesting is down here, the NEF RAW file processing. Let's have a look at how this works. So here's our main outdoor test shot taken from the Skyline Gondola. And of course, it's taken as a RAW file. And here are the options that you can do when processing the pictures in camera. You can choose the degree of JPEG compression, also the JPEG image size, the white balance setting, you can apply exposure compensation. You can also change the picture control. Now this actually opens up a huge array of possibilities because if I look just within the, say, the standard picture control here, you can see that I can actually adjust the sharpening, the contrast, brightness, saturation, and hue. So this gives you a great deal of flexibility when you're processing your raw files within the camera. Below that, you can change the high ISO noise reduction, the color space, and finally, the de-lighting setting. Let's have a look at the impact of a variety of those. And then when you're ready, you just click the Execute button here. And you can see an example of a RAW file processed in camera compared to one that was processed using Nikon's Capture NX software in the results pages. Just finally, a nice feature of the information screen is that when it gets very dark, which I've simulated there by putting the lens cap on, you can see the colour scheme changes to something a lot more discreet. This isn't going to destroy your night vision when you're shooting under dim conditions. And then when it gets brighter again, or say you go from inside to outside, you can see that display switch back to that rather satisfying shade of light blue. That's the end of the first part of my Nikon D7000 demonstration, but there's three more parts to go. In part two, I'll be looking at the camera's continuous shooting and auto-focusing capabilities. I really missed out on that action sequence. How can I get this camera to shoot at six frames per second for more than just a few seconds? In part three, I'll be checking out the sensor, the image processing, and also the camera's new live view facilities. However, there were a number of occasions when D7000 did overexpose quite significantly. And I've noticed this on a few previous Nikon DSLRs too, in particular under the very bright conditions that you see in Queenstown on the daylight today. And in part four, I'll be checking out the D7000's brand new 1080p movie mode, complete with autofocusing while filming. Now Nikon kickstarted the whole video on the DSLR thing back with the D90, so it's not surprising to find on its successor the company really raising its game in the terms of features and control that's possible. You can find parts 2, 3 and 4 of my D7000 video demonstration over at Cameralabs.com and in that full review you'll also find detailed results comparing the D7000 against its predecessor the D90 and its big new rival the Canon EOS 60D. I've also provided sample images and movie files for you to download and check out on your own computer. And of course, there's my in-depth verdict, which compares the D7000 against key rivals. And alongside that, all of the latest and best prices for all of these models. So if you're interested in a mid-range DSLR, you know where to go right now. Head on over to my full review at Cameralabs.com.